Anyway, Thaddeus in Springfield, thanks for waiting. What's up? Hey, how you hey, doing? That is. <clears throat> I'm all right. I'll say, uh, before I get into my question, I would just like to mention, you guys were talking about the uh, Passion of the Christ. Yeah. And I remember when that movie came out, I was 10 years old, and my mom made me go to the theater to watch that. How, what did you think about it? And, and what was your religious view at the time, and what did you think well, about the movie? With, to be quite honest, I don't think I could ever call myself a Christian. Like, in all honesty, I was just scared into believing into it. And sure. I, I mean, around the time I turned 15, I was just like, no, it's bullshit. But I remember the movie, there was one part where they're nailing him to the cross, and while they, like, hit the nail, like, there was some guy off screen that had to, like, squirt up blood yep. as they hit that nail. And I was just like, dude, like, Saw doesn't even go that far. What the heck? <laughs> But I mean, did, did you did you cry? Did you feel sad about what was happening to that individual? I felt sick. Yeah, it's kind of gross. It was far. I I think you've hit it on the head. I think it was closer to Saw than to an actual tragedy. But and, I, and that's like that's the Jesus movie that made the most bucks. Like the recent one, Son of God, didn't even come close. Yeah, it's like yeah, bloody bloody Christ made all the money. But my question is um. I go to church with my mom because she has cancer and I want to make her feel good. Sure. Um, I just don't want to start a fight with her when she's going to be dead in the next 10 to 15 months. So um, I, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear about your mom's condition, but I can completely appreciate it. And not that you need any uh, uh, approval from us, but I'd probably do the same damn thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and there was a uh, the, the the preacher. He often will put on video clips because it's a it's not a mega church, but it is a big church. And there's a gigantic like flat screen up in the front, almost like a movie movie theater screen, but not mm -hmm. quite. And he'll put like videos up there of like atheist versus Christian debate sometimes. Oh wow! And um, he did a he he put up a podcast up there with Frank Turek. Yeah. And Frank Turek was talking about the omnipotence paradox, where you know it's usually presented as. Can God create a stone so heavy he himself cannot lift it? And I was right. like, yeah, I mean, it's a valid question, can he? And then Frank Turk goes off into this spiel about how God can't do things that are logically impossible because right. a stone so heavy God can't lift it is, like, logically impossible, therefore it can't exist. Yeah, and modern theologians have redefined what they mean by omnipotence yeah, as and then all power like, that is logically possible. And so God doesn't have to have all power, including the power to violate logic. He just has to be the single most powerful being possible. And then, I don't have like, a problem with that. It can, it, like, I fall back on the Ethifro dilemma. Like, whenever yeah. you present that, they're all like, well, he is the good. And then you can just step it back. Well, you know, what determines what is good? Like, what determines his nature? Yeah, it's like, a little different when you get into the, to, into the morality thing versus but, omnipotence, yeah. But when you, they say, okay, we can't defy the laws of logic, well, then what determines the laws of logic? No, they're not determined. They're just they're just the facts. Uh, they're just the facts of, of well, but everything, not just reality. Something but. that created everything not then in turn be the creator of the laws of logic? So the, the, there's a view of God that um, God is also bound by these, I, the, whether you call them logical absolutes, laws of logic, laws of thought, whatever. We're talking about identity, non-contradiction, exclude the middle. And... Uh, they are so clearly um, fallacious. Abs no, no, no. They're, they're the real deal. They're the foundation of all reasonable thought. And they are so clearly absolute and inviolate that it has forced theologians to rework the language they use to describe how God can operate. And most, most modern theologians that, that you know, have a, an understanding of you know, basic philosophy who aren't just, you know, the, I started preaching at 12 uh, and, and didn't bother for any of that book learning other than the good book. Uh, most of them acknowledge that this is, must be the case. Uh, and then they don't have a particular problem with it because it, there's no need for a God or the God to be able to violate the laws of logic to, in order Where to still they be. come from if they're not created by the creator of the universe? So they, they, they don't they don't come from anywhere. They they are so they true even if nothing the exists. Of a supreme being. What's that? So they supersede the existence of a pre the supreme being. Yes. So now we have a concept that is more eternal than an eternal being. Yeah. Well, see, the, they're they're <laughs> not something that exists. They're not things or entities. Well, the, I mean, these are just descriptions of truths, 
and they're true even if nothing exists. Yeah, but I mean, well, ontologically speaking, if the laws of logic exist they have no in, ontology in our mind, then do it, the, 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 does the concept itself not exist? Like, for example, morality. They don't tech morals don't technically exist other than what we determine them to be. Yeah, good, good and evil don't exist as things. They have no ontology, much like the the laws I mean, of thought that we're talking. But good and evil are labels that we put on things, evaluating consequences with respect to goals. <laughs> Oh. Okay. Uh huh. So actually, Frank Turek is somebody that I'm, you know, I'm at least looking forward to the the possibility of debating in the future. I think there was discussion once in the past, but it didn't actually happen. Uh, but this idea, so the omnipotence paradox, um, I'll probably do a video on it at some point because the simplistic can God create a rock so big you can't lift it? Um, it only addresses notions of God that are naive well, and they, it's I, I not a response it, to anything that, you know, most modern theologians would posit. You know, I, I presented it in a different way. I don't, you know, I try not to um, present it using um, our standards of measurement, like example, weight. Um, I, I would say rather, can God create something he himself could not even destroy? Yeah, for example, himself. Anything could, can can, can God do? Himself. Can God do the logically impossible? And the answer is no. So, then omnipotence just is just arbitrarily defined as whatever people want to define it as, I guess. Well, it, so it's a simplistic notion, omnipotence. Um, and when the flaws in the, the simplistic notion were presented, reasonable people said, "Ah, clearly." Uh, we don't mean that. So the only thing that they're saying, to the extent that they will say God is omnipotent, is that God is maximally powerful. He is the most powerful being. He has all power and capability that is not logically contradictory. And that's fine. Uh, they can define their God however they want. You can define a God that, hey, he's not the most powerful being. He's the, uh, you know, 10% shy of being the most powerful being and still <laughs> say that like, that's what, what, sorry? It's the concept of infinity. Like you could give the biggest number you want to give, but you're nowhere close to infinity. You could be as, as powerful as you want to be as powerful, but if you're not omnipotent, you're nowhere, clear, clear, uh, nowhere close to omnipotence. Yeah, but you're either omnipotent or you're not. You there's no requirement. There's no, there's no intrinsic requirement about the God label. That it must have omnipotence or omniscience well, I mean, or omnipresence. The Abrahamic God is described as such in the No, it's not. Text. Th th that's that's the thing, is it's actually not. Those words omnipotent, omniscient, none of those exist in the text. Uh, there are concepts that are about God knows everything that can be known, or and and they are simplified as God knows all, or God can do all things. But and the ancient people probably didn't have any understanding of God can do all things that are logically possible. But you, you don't get to judge the, the, the God concept that's being offered based on uh, a straw man version that people from the past understood. You can say that the God that, you know, if you believe in this God, he clearly doesn't exist. And I'm with that all day long. We can demonstrate that logically inconsistent beings don't exist. But that's not a response to somebody who's saying God isn't omnipotent in the old sense. He is maximally powerful. But then isn't that just playing semantics to suit a narrative? No. But, like, if we're going to just switch words around to mean something now that they didn't then, I mean, we're just... No, because, well because, because that, that would only be true if you were saying the ancient people had a clearer understanding and concept of God than the modern people do. And the modern people are saying that's not the case. If the modern people were saying the ancient people, you know, apart from Adam and Eve who may or may not have walked with a god, uh, but they're not the ones that are telling you anything. But if the, if the modern people were saying, yes, these ancient people understood God better than we do, then you would be able to, to talk about what those ancient people meant in the words that they used. But if the modern theologians are saying that they understand God better than the ancient people did, then you have to address the God that the modern people are, are doing. Otherwise, you're attacking a straw man. I see. Um, Besides, it's, well, it's an arbitrary definition anyway. You could, you know, you 
come up with a god and you can give it whatever attributes you want. So there's, you know, if you want to say maximally powerful, you can, yeah, I mean, you can say that and that's the god that you're positing. And there's still, you still don't have any evidence for that god. The ancient Greek and Roman gods were not omnipotent and yet they were still gods. Yeah. But no, you, um, I, I, yeah, I, I do that sometimes. I'll like, uh, for example, when someone pre pre uh, presents Pascal's wager to me, I'll be like, okay, well, what if my God who only likes people who wear Nike shoes yep. is the real God? Then, then what? I wear Nikes, so. I wear Nikes on occasion. Mostly I wear boots, <laughs> but I have some Nikes. So do you have to wear the Nikes all the time? No, as long as you wear Nike shoes at some point in your lifetime. It's like the concept of. Some, We're going some, to Nike some, heaven. <laughs> Uh, unless you're like poor and uh, don't wear shoes at all. <laughs> How do you know that the Nikes you have are real and not like cheap knockoffs that just somebody put the swoosh on? Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> Damn to hell for, for not yep. wearing proper Nikes. So yeah, that's, that's how I just refute that with the anyway, of your false economy. Um, that is, yeah. I appreciate the call. I've got one more call I want to try to get to before we run out of time. If that's oh, all right. Yeah. yeah thanks man. Bye. Appreciate it. Yeah. Let's go ahead and get Victor uh, queued up. Did you want to? You might have had more to say on the omnipotence thing. No, I just uh, I think it's it's sort of like saying God is maximally purple. It's like okay, <laughs> um, whatever. The you know, purplest being that could have. Yeah, that's. It, it it's it, there's a an issue of kind of colloquialisms, and uh, if I were to say you know, oh man, my wife can cook anything or do anything, or sew anything, or whatever. Uh, there's a slight exaggeration there that's kind of understood, because she can't, she can't knit an Earth. Literally, yeah. Uh, you know, an, an actual, another planet for us to live on. Um, and understanding that that's the case, uh, if someone were to say, oh, well, you're wrong, because, you know, here's an example of something, you know, that's clearly logically absurd for your wife to... Uh, you have to talk about it. That's one of the reasons why I like to do the tell me what you believe and why. Because one of the biggest mistakes that atheists can make is to uh, saddle someone with views that they don't necessarily have. Mm -hmm. Now, if they say, I'm a Bible believing what, what to whatever, um, then you can talk about what the Bible says and, and have a discussion about where you may or may not disagree. But if you start, you know, if you're talking to a Protestant, and you start talking about how they believe that the cracker turns into the literal body of Christ through transubstantiation, you just told them you don't know what the hell you're talking about because that's a predominantly Catholic doctrine that they have never believed. And so now you're arguing against some God. You know, when I was a Southern Baptist, Catholics were Mary worshiping, idol worshiping non Christians. They were in a cult that where the Pope and the church were the true. Uh, foundation and not Jesus Christ and not the Bible. And that's why they have extra books that weren't part of it. We Catholics are great people. We loved them because that's what we were supposed to do. But they're, you know, they're a bunch of heathens pretending to be Christians. I mean, that was the view that we had. Mm -hmm. And if you came to me and started talking about Catholic doctrine uh, when I was a Southern Baptist, I would have agreed with you all day long. Yep. Yep. Oh, yeah, that's terrible. That's stupid doctrine. How can they believe that?